This April, my family and I made the big move to Perth, Western Australia. We are absolutely loving life here. Before our move, it was really difficult to find information and content on YouTube about what Perth is really like and especially as a young family, we wanted to research and know as much as possible. I enjoy sharing our experience and trust that it might help others who are going through a similar move. As a young family, we're blown away by the wonderful lifestyle this beautiful part of the world can offer our family and we really look forward to putting down roots here and calling this our forever home. I hope you enjoy the videos, please subscribe to my channel and don't forget to follow along for more adventures and our experience of living in Perth, WA. Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. If it's your first time landing here today, my name is Kathy. If you're one of my regular viewers, then you know I make videos all about life in Australia, specifically Perth, Western Australia, where we moved to in April 2022. The videos are aimed at helping those who are planning the immigration to Perth just to make it a little bit less scary, a little bit less foreign when you do touch down here. And I'm just sharing information that I actually wish we had known before we made this move. I hope you enjoy the videos. Please give them a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already and hit that notifications bell so that you can get notified as soon as I upload a video. Today's video is all about traveling with a toddler or infant. For my fellow parents who are planning this big move, this is probably the most immediate daunting thing on your mind. It's just mobilizing your family and being on board an airplane for such a long time. Australia is pretty far away from the rest of the world, no matter where you live. And because of that, I think it can be quite scary to imagine sitting on a flight for maybe 10 to 16 hours. I had the journey with my little girl twice. We initially did our one-way ticket to Perth from Johannesburg. That was with my husband and I when we actually made our big move, and that was in April. But then if you have been following my channel, I had a loss in my family and I had to travel back home to South Africa quite unexpectedly at the beginning of August. And due to the time frame and just when my husband started his job, etc., it didn't make sense for him to fly back home with me to South Africa. So that journey I had to do solo and uh, I had to do the return journey home solo as well. So I hope I can shed some light for parents who are traveling together, but even parents who might have to do the journey alone if your partner has had to already come ahead to Australia or has to stay behind for whatever reason while you go home for a bit. So yeah, I think I can give a couple of tips and things that we found really work for our little toddler. She is approaching two, so that is quite a difficult age group. I'm sure many parents can relate, but the trip we did when we moved to Australia, she was 18 months and having traveled with her then versus now, I can just tell you um, the initial trip when she was younger was a lot easier. So I think it depends. Every child is different, but I really hope that the tips and tricks I share with you today could benefit you and just set your mind at ease and give your little one the most peaceful journey possible. First tip for you is going to be what to do when booking your flights. Of course, there are a hundred factors that are going to impact what flights you book, things like pricing, when you have to start your work, all of those come into consideration, but I would strongly recommend trying to push for a night flight. It is just that much more likely that your child is going to feel relaxed and ready to sleep, at least for the bulk of the flight. So it gives you a little bit of downtime as a parent. If you can, uh, try and schedule the longest leg flights at night. So that would be perhaps if you're flying to Thailand or you're flying to Singapore and then on to Australia, make sure that that is a nighttime flight. It's just that much calmer. I have done a day flight now with Novi and it was a lot more strenuous and she really struggled. I found compared to when we flew at night and she could just catch some, some zeds. Next thing to consider when booking your flight is where to sit. Now they do allow children under the age of two, they are classified as infants. So you have the option of not having to pay for an additional seat and your child can sit on your lap or they try and give you a bassinet seat. So from our experience, if your child is older than a year, so I would say anything from 12 months up, 
I would not go for a bassinet seat. Generally, the babies are quite big at this stage and they don't fit snugly into the bassinets anymore. The bassinets are also quite disruptive in that once your baby is asleep and you put them in the bassinet, if the seatbelt sign comes on, you have to wake your baby, take them out the bassinet, and if you've got an older child, they just don't fall asleep as easily as a little infant might. So I would strongly recommend opting to not have a bassinet if your child is 12 months and older. Then, of course, it would be great if you and your husband are traveling together or you and your wife and you're able to book out a row of seats. Perhaps the middle seat won't be taken and you would be able to stretch out your little one and let them have enough space during the trip. However, if it's a full flight, that might not be an option. I would do everything in my power to make sure I get an aisle seat, especially if your little one is mobile, crawling or walking and you need to also get up and down for nappy changes, just go for the aisle seat and try if possible go to the, the back of the plane. It's just a little bit calmer usually back there, a little bit quieter, so aisle seat as far back as you can possibly get to. So it has been quite handy finding a seat close to the crew galley. This is usually a little bit of open space between the aisles and the bathrooms etc and it allows you a space to go and rock your little one to try and get them to fall asleep. It's usually a bit quieter, a bit calmer once they dim the lights. So that gives you a little bit of extra room if you have the option. Moving on to point number two is what to pack on your flight. So I'm going to do a couple of video inserts here as I'm talking about the items that I found very useful and I hope that they come in handy for you. But at no time would I ever want you to feel pressured, like you need to go out and buy a whole bunch of stuff because yeah I'm just I'm not huge on buying everything someone else has used because it might not work for your own child but there are a few items that I think uh, were useful and perhaps you might pick a couple that would be good for you and your family. I'm going to touch on a few toys and activities that I thought were great and easy to pack so try and go and buy your child a couple of new little mini books. So something like this in a set was great because I could ration the books out for her. It doesn't weigh much more than a normal child book would. Try and look for books that have a lot of detail in them. So lots of different little pictures and little stories because you want the book to last as long as possible. So as many different things in the pages as possible that you can point to and ask them to identify. This was a really cute little option. And the products that I explained today, I'll do my best to link below for you so that hopefully you can find them online or on Amazon or wherever you do your shopping for your kiddies' toys. The next type of toy I would recommend investing in is something completely different and unique, something that has maybe got a little bit of sound or feels different and will keep them interested, something that also isn't a million pieces because you might want to give this to your child when you're at a point that you're, say, checking in. So we found this really cool little rattle slug and he can do a hundred different things. He's beautifully bright colors and very lightweight. So this was a great option. It kept her busy for quite a while when we gave this to her. So have a look in your stores for something similar. So the next item I'd recommend is getting your little one headphones that are size appropriate for their ears. The airlines do offer some, but usually they don't fit well and the little ones get them off. So opt for something that's easy to, to attract them. Obviously it's cute, it's colorful, and it's very comfortable with a nice padding. You might even opt for noise cancelling. So even if your child isn't using these for screen time, you might play nursery rhymes to them or even some white noise or anything like that just to help them settle and calm down. Something as simple as this, like a random little flat abacus, it's really old school, but it's really lightweight and this keeps them busy for ages. You are able to obviously show them different colors, count with them using this toy. So I feel it's got a lot of multi-purposes and it's also something that makes quite a bit of noise, it's like a bit of a rattle. Then consider buying something that gets your child moving when they're able to move about at a layover. So I invested in a little piano mat, which encouraged my little girl to dance and jump around and just be a bit silly and burn off some energy while my husband and and I could enjoy a coffee and take five minutes to rest up. So I'd strongly recommend something like that. It doesn't have to be exactly this idea, but something that gets them active and is lightweight that can pack easily. In the standards, things like coloring in books and anything fidgety, like a fidget cube was incredibly useful. Um, I gave this to my little girl as I was checking in and it kept her busy flicking switches and 
lightweight, really easy to pack. But I hope that these products give you some inspiration to source some goodies that'll work for you and your little one. I think it's really important to identify times in your travel where your attention is going to be uh, off your child or just divided, where you're going to be checking in or you're going to be waiting on the airplane before it takes off or you've landed and you're waiting to disembark. Those were sort of the red zones for us with traveling where our daughter would get niggly because they don't want to wait around and your attention's not on them 100%. You're trying to get all your things together or get checked in. So those are the points I would recommend you give them a little toy or a little activity. So imagine at check-in, they're in their pram. That's when you're going to bring out the fidget cube, brand new, wow, amazing. And they're going to start playing with that for five to ten minutes while you get your stuff checked in and then when you're waiting on the airplane before takeoff you're going to be able to settle them with a sticker book or a coloring book and chatting to them about something and then perhaps it's time to bring out storybooks when you're waiting to disembark again so try and save all of your activities for those sort of difficult moments in your travel i would make yourself a timeline and plan out what you might give to them when so you don't end up giving them everything the first two hours into your journey and the novelty of what you've purchased or bought along with you is lost. And when it comes to sanitizing, so pack yourself some sanitizer wipes and as far as possible sanitize areas when your little one is not in their pram or stroller. So for example, when you sit down in the, the airplane, you're going to sanitize the armrests, the screens, the little flyers that have safety instructions on them, anything your little one might be touching. And obviously also sanitize areas like the bathroom if you're gonna be changing their diapers and things like that. So, and then try and find one that is safe for their skin and their hands because you're not always gonna have access to running water. And baby wipes generally might you know, clean their hands of dirt, but are not necessarily removing germs. And yeah, I felt it was just really important that when you're making this huge move, with your little one not to get sick on the way, and you're sitting in either a new country with a sick toddler immediately, or you're arriving at a holiday destination and you're sick. So yeah, goes big on the sanitizing wipes. They really come in handy. And the next thing would probably be snacks. So this is a tough one because snacks are life. If you are the mom of a toddler, you've got to pack snacks, but obviously you want to try and opt for things that are low in sugar, try and opt for crunchy, savory, healthy type snacks, or little mini fruit snacks or something like that, that's not going to spike your kiddie's sugar. So it can be tempting at times to probably bribe your kid with sugar just to get them to cooperate and keep them happy and smiley. But on the offset of that, I think giving your kid lots of sweet treats just messes with their their blood sugar a little bit and they tend to bounce off the walls or not really know what's going on um, with regards to you suddenly giving them all the sugar so try not for healthy snacks if possible it's also usually just cleaner there's not a sticky mess to tidy up so i love packing things like uh, little rice cakes for her to enjoy we did pack a few sweet treats in the form of uh, fruit bites or fruit leather and i enjoyed taking punnets of like blueberries all of those items, any fresh items, you obviously have to throw away before touching down in Australia, but no issues with packaged snacks, um, freeze-dried fruit, anything like that is allowed. Just declare it at customs to be safe if you have any leftovers. But yeah, think carefully about what snacks you're packing. Think with regards to stickiness. Think with regards to what's good for your little one and their bodies on this long journey. So you rather overpack with snacks. Bring more snacks than you think you need because they do tend to eat quite a lot while traveling. It's a form of entertainment, I guess, as well when they're bored. And it can be used just to settle them or make them calm as well um, if they're really struggling to settle into a flight. So a few tips when you're actually on the flight. So number one is going to be when they're serving meals, I recommend if you're traveling with your partner to tag team it and each of you take a turn to eat your meal. Usually the cabin crew are very accommodating if you have a little one and you could just ask them to bring either your or your husband's meal after. That way one of you can entertain the little one while the other is able to quickly eat something. Make friends with the cabin crew. Usually from our experience, the cabin crew are so friendly and helpful. They really know that traveling with a little one is tough. And I felt we traveled with Singapore Airlines. I felt the staff went 
above and beyond at trying to keep us comfortable as parents and even helping entertain our little girl if she was having a moment. So yeah, be friendly with them and don't be afraid to ask for help. I strongly recommend that you change your little one's nappy or diaper pretty much straight after takeoff. So as soon as the captain switches off the seatbelt sign, get up and go change their nappy because the bathrooms are still quite clean and in good condition. And generally they do tend to fill their nappies quite quickly on the airplane. So get that out the way and you can settle in then and enjoy some time in your seats after the nappy change. Then I tried to pack myself a little nappy pouch system. So basically I would use her nappy changing mat. I would fold a nappy into the nappy changing mat along with the wipes and I would just grab this quickly and go to the, the nappy changing area in the bathrooms. The nappy changing stations are quite small so I would recommend if you have a toddler to maybe consider using pull-ups. It's just much easier especially for wet nappies that you don't have to worry about trying to get your toddler to lie down um, and you really don't want things like touching the floor and all of that. So I would lay down my nappy changing mat on the lid of the toilet and then let her stand while I quickly changed her nappy. Um, yeah, just a, an idea and hopefully it does help. Obviously, a lot of parents are concerned for takeoff and landing with regard to their little one's ears. So babies use station tubes are not fully developed yet and they do tend to suffer with earache. Uh, certain babies, not all. Our little girl luckily doesn't struggle with equalizing and her ears do really well, but you do want to have something for your baby to try and suck during takeoff and landing. So if they're still drinking a bottle or breastfeeding, then that would be the perfect opportunity to offer them that. Alternatively, you can use a pacifier if your toddler is obviously weaned and is no longer using a bottle or, or nursing so yeah but try and have them suck something just to take the extra pressure off their ears it helps equalize on that note you are allowed to carry liquids for your little one so especially for uh, moms who are formula feeding or are worried about taking some water on board for their toddler you are more than welcome to do that security um, does give you allowance for that so no stress you can pack your bottles and then just ask your cabin crew to assist you if you need boiling water or anything like that they're super friendly and super helpful in that regard it can be difficult if it's a busy flight and you've got people around you who are trying to sleep and your little one might be quite busy and just trying to interact and i know especially as a first-time mom um, you can easily feel flustered and stressed out so i strongly recommend you just make peace with the fact that your little one might act out. It's a huge flight and it's a huge ask of them to sit still and be well behaved for such a long time in a confined space surrounded by strangers. So just have grace with yourself and have grace with your little one. Try chat to the people around you. Try break the ice. Be friendly and you'll be surprised just how kind the average person is. 99% of people on the flight have got kids, have probably flown, flown with their own children at some point or could imagine flying with them at some point. So yeah, just have a little bit of, of grace with yourself and try not to get too worked up if you're having a tough day with your little one. You want to be sure you've packed a change of clothes for yourself and your baby. Depending on the duration of your flight and also the age of your baby, you might want to pack more than one change of clothes. So for my toddler and I, I was comfortable packing us each one set of fresh clothes. Um, but for a younger baby who might still be having blowout nappies or just getting a bit messier for whatever reason and is constantly being carried by mom who would probably get messy if baby got messy, maybe you want to consider packing uh, two sets of clothes for yourself. It is really refreshing as well being such a long journey when you do get to sort of your first stopover to go into the bathrooms and just freshen up and change your clothes. You feel so much better for it. So I would also recommend that you research your layover airports, wherever you're going to be stopping over, let's say Bangkok, or perhaps you're stopping over in Singapore, that you actually find a map and locate kids facilities and know where you're headed once you do touch down. This way your child finds a little play area where they can burn off some much needed steam and you sort of are catering to their needs first. When it comes to bedtime and just trying to get your toddler to settle on the aeroplane, obviously making their bedtime routine as similar to home as possible is going to help a lot. So things like taking your child's favorite cuddle toy, uh, if they have a bottle right before bed or some warm milk, 
The cabin crew are usually very helpful to organize this for you. And then perhaps a blanket and a lullaby or white noise, whatever you usually do at home to settle your little one, a specific storybook. Um, yeah, just try and follow the sort of motions of a bedtime routine and you'll be surprised at how just by keeping that going, your little one falls into, into that routine and will probably fall asleep without too much of a struggle. Then when it comes to in-flight meals, so they do have baby food options, which are like baby pouches or purees. Our little girl is old enough now to have normal food. Uh, we didn't order her a meal because obviously we are happy to share with her and she had a whole bunch of snacks, but you could order her a meal ahead of time, especially if you've booked a seat for your little one. The cabin crew were incredibly helpful. They gave us an extra like bread roll and cheese and a little bit of a fruit cup in the morning, things that I knew she would eat because she wasn't going to sit down and eat the whole stew and rice meal or whatever they served. So yeah, just be, uh, just communicate with the cabin crew and they're usually really helpful and happy to give you some biscuits or snacks for your little one as well um, during the supper time service. So is a travel stroller worth it? I think absolutely yes. Um, being a toddler mom, I thought she, she really didn't enjoy a pram anymore and I just thought it wasn't going to be useful. But especially on my trip down solo, I used the, the pram, the travel stroller, so much. I used it to carry my luggage mostly while I carried my baby if she didn't want to be in the actual pram. But it was just such a blessing to have to load up and act as a mini trolley while you're schlepping around the airports. So just keep that in mind. It was also a great place for her to sleep on longer layovers. It meant she had a little place I could recline it and she did actually get a little bit of sleep. The, the benefit of a travel stroller is that it's allowed in aircraft, so you're able to keep it in the overhead. And if your little one does fall asleep, you could probably transfer them into the stroller after you've landed and wheel them off. This only happened on our one flight where she actually um, she fell asleep just before we landed in Bangkok. And I was able to transfer her and then she kept sleeping until we got to check in where I was able to check in. She was in her pram, which was great. And then she woke up about 30 minutes after that. So strongly recommend, in my opinion. I was lucky enough to borrow one from a friend. And I would probably go out and buy one tomorrow if I knew we had another international trip. And a little bit of self-care when it comes to maybe supplements or medicines or whatever you plan to do to just protect yourself and make yourself feel more calm. So maybe consider getting yourself a rescue remedy just to pop before you actually get on the flight. And I think it just sets your mind at ease really and does help you stay calm and relaxed because it is going to be a long journey ahead. Then if you want to just have a preventative, which I found worked really well, a preventative for colds and flu or getting any kind of virus while traveling. I use the VIX First Defense. It's a nasal spray and I actually developed a slight tickle in my throat and I started to use that and I never got sick. So yeah, it basically encapsulates bugs or viruses and it, it prevents them from taking roots in your system. So yeah, maybe worth a try. It's a preventative, so prevention is always better than cure. You've got nothing to lose in my opinion. It's not safe for little kids, but for parents, if you can beat being sick, it's much easier to look after your little one when you're healthy and strong. Then when it comes to jet lag, they now have supplements, uh, melatonin supplements, which they say do help. And I believe if your child is over the age of two, they're able to use that as well. We didn't go with that approach. I did, however, invest in some Arnica homeopathic drops. I will link that down below. And that's something I took. It really just takes the edge off the jet lag. So especially when it comes to muscle aches, body soreness, and just feeling um, that physical fatigue. So that helped a lot. Obviously, your sleeping patterns still need to adjust, but I felt just having the Arnica drops just helped my body recover from the actual journey physically much quicker than when I didn't take them. This is for the departure or when you're leaving your home country to finally make that big move. And I realize every single family is different, but looking back on our experience, we didn't have our family come to the airport to give us a big goodbye. We did our goodbyes the night before. We had a family get together. And I think it was so much better for us and for our little one. I'd strongly recommend, if it's possible, to avoid doing a big emotional goodbye at the airport. 
Parents, if you get upset, your little one definitely picks up on those vibes. And also just as a parent going into this new and exciting chapter, saying goodbye to the people you love is probably the hardest part of this whole journey. And I feel like the airport is just not a great place. It's it's busy and saying goodbye to them in this hustle and bustle, it just never feels like a good goodbye. It's just never a easy or, or pleasant thing. We did do a big family goodbye at um, the airport when we moved to Dubai. And if I had to compare the two experiences, I would strongly recommend not doing that. Just have a lovely family get together the night before, pack your bags and, and you make your way as a little family to the airport and put yourself on that flight and just go with that excitement and that joy and that hope ahead of you and have had done your goodbyes the day before you've sort of made peace and you you're ready to make that move and jump on that airplane then when it comes to packing so you obviously want to have as little luggage and hand luggage as possible where you can i would strongly recommend having a baby bag dedicated not with mom stuff in it as well um, and then having your your own bag and there are a couple of reasons for it but basically i used to keep the snacks and everything in my bag so that if she did get into her baby bag it was just the usual nappies and and whatnot so that she wasn't tempted to open up snacks or new toys and get access to everything so try that approach it also means that your documents your passports and things like that will probably be in your bag or perhaps your husband will take charge of that um, when i was traveling alone i kept that all in my bag so i didn't have to keep opening her baby bag and getting everything messed up that being said though i would strongly recommend getting yourself something like this this came in a set of three different sizes. It's just a reusable, basically, compartment bag. So if you wanted to pack in clothes or make one of these for toys or, um, yeah, just to organize your, your backpack and your baby bag a little bit better, I found them very useful. And it stayed, the bag stayed a lot more organized than when I used it uh, without these on traveling before. So, yeah, just something that might assist you. Then coming from South Africa to Australia, that was definitely a lot worse when it came to jet lag versus when I traveled from Australia back home. That's obviously because we're in Perth and the time zones and the way it all works, it was an easy adjustment flying back east. Um, but coming out here and jumping six hours ahead was much harder on our bodies so just make peace with the fact that you are going to have jet lag you and your family and i would just try to get into your little one's routine on local time as quickly as possible so probably the first morning is tough you've got to set your alarm you've got to try wake up and get out into the sunshine let your body's circadian rhythms start to kick in and as hard as that is just do it just get into it as quickly as you can and then also invest in a few little things calming activities to do at night when your little one is up so for us we were awake mostly from about 2 a.m to 5 a.m which was really hard and that was about three or four nights in a row after we landed in australia so have a few quiet activities things like little puzzles or um, nighttime coloring in or invest in a couple more nighttime storybooks what we tried to do, even though she was wide awake, we would try to keep the curtains closed. We wouldn't put on bright lights. We wouldn't put on the TV. We would try and just keep it as calm and quiet and peaceful as much as we could make it like bedtime, even though we were all sitting up awake, drinking some tea and, and playing games. Um, so that was the approach we took. And we were feeling much better, I would say by day six or seven. So it takes a while. And it's really hard as the adult because think we could push through you know for 24 or 48 hours and then our bodies would adjust quicker but with little ones you've got to let them nap you've got to make sure they're eating at normal times and just be patient just give their bodies time to adjust and do what you can then I trialed a product which was really great from VIX it's a first defense nasal spray so what this does you're, you're supposed to spray it just before you travel, so a couple of days before, and use it also throughout your trip. And it basically, from what I understand, it's like a gel that encapsulates um, germs and viruses and stuff and prevents them from being able to take root in your system. So 
I found this really great. I started getting a tickle in my throat about two days before I flew back home to South Africa. And I knew I would be doing the trip solo and that I just couldn't get sick. After doing, um, you know, yeah, I just, it wasn't COVID. I did a rat test, but I didn't want to get sick. So I took, if you're someone whose little one uses a pacifier, pack as many as you possibly have and try and clip the pacifier to yourself. I toddler thought it was the funniest thing to throw it around the airplane eventually. She was bored and I spent, on the first flight, I spent quite a bit of time on my hands and knees. I was clipping it on her the whole time, so she just figured out how to rip that clip off. But once I tied it onto myself, it was a little bit harder for her to get rid of and throw away. So yeah, I'd strongly recommend um, bring as many as you can. Bring some sanitizing wipes that are safe for pacifiers because they are probably going to fall on the floor and you don't always have access to a basin and soap. So yeah, be prepared when it comes to pacifier care. And then lastly, guys, just be as organized as you possibly can. Have all your documents in an easy to reach place. Pack and repack if you need to. Just make it as simple for yourself as possible. Know where everything is. Try not to overpack hand luggage. It can be tempting to throw things in and be like, we might need this or we might use that. But really, after having done the trip a couple of times, take essentials and take your kid enough things to do rather than taking excess and having to schlep so much around with you. And it just causes more stress. There's more stuff to lose, more stuff to manage. So try to keep it simple. So when you land in Australia, it's really important to just declare anything that you have in your luggage or your hand luggage that you're not sure about. They will hand out your arrival cards and list the items that are usually a concern for border control. But in our experience, it's just better to be honest. And if you have the slightest doubt, rather just ask and fill it out, tick on the form that you're unsure about it and they will help you and say yes or no. But if you don't disclose that information, there's always the risk that they think you're trying to hide something, which is not pleasant and you don't want to go through that process of them unpacking your bag and all of that. So just when it comes to customs, when in doubt, just declare it and they will guide you. They're super helpful and super friendly. I know it can feel intimidating landing in a new country, but rather just be transparent and let them let them guide you on what is allowed and what is not. So then we just tried to make a game of everything for her. So we tried to explain as much as we could about the airplane and where we're going and just to be in that moment with her, keeping in mind your kid has got no concept of time. They don't know how long 14 hours is going to feel and I think you can really make it as good a 14 hours or as bad a 14 hours as possible just based on your attitude and your approach to the whole thing. It's tough, it's exhausting, you're probably going to be really tired when you reach your destination but I think staying positive and upbeat and just mentally preparing yourself as a parent you're going to be streets ahead and so happy just to be making that big move finally and hopefully enjoying this amazing experience um, of what immigrating actually is. That's it for today's video. I really hope that you found these points useful and interesting and I hope that some of the tips come in handy for you and your little one. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. If you have any comments or advice or tips, if you've traveled with a little one to Australia before, please drop them down below so we can all help each other out. Thanks so much for spending a little part of your day with me. I love creating content and videos for you and I know this was one that was requested quite a lot by my viewers. I'm excited for the next vlog which is going to be coming up probably in about 10 days time we're going on our very first camping trip in the bush and i cannot wait to share that experience with you so until then i'll catch you in the next one